Hello and welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 Hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. Of course, we're blessed to always be joined by our producer, Wes Davenport, who you guys heard recently with Cheater Sham on the last episode, the all mailbag episode. Can't get him on here enough. We appreciate him. And if you're not listening to him and Blake over on the pin down on the Detroit Bad Boys YouTube channel, you guys need to be checking that out. I think they're going live. Um, is it tonight, Wes? No, it can't be tonight. You guys don't go live on Mondays. When you put it in the chat, let me know when you guys are going live so I can boost that. Maybe put it in the chat, the link, so everybody can find that. Omari, I got to first ask this. I have no idea what you've been tweeting about recently. Can you fill me in on what's going on? It's like all of these different rappers. Like, is there a rap? Is, is there a beef going on or something? Like Wednesday at 7.30 for Wes and Blake over there. So fill me in on what's going on with your Twitter, Omari. So the 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 short version of the story is that uh, Drake and Jayco made a song last year called First Person Shooter. And in the song, one of them said, like, we're the big three or something, including Kendrick in that. And then Kendrick was featured on a future album that came out three weeks ago. And he was basically like, there's no big three. It's just big Ooh. me. Oh. Like, kind of like, like, I'm like, I'm the best. Like, don't put me in the same category as you guys. And it's funny because Kendrick, well, I was going to tell the short version, but it's turning into the long version. So let's just do the long version. Kendrick's been trying to pick a, a, a rap battle with like Drake and or J. Cole for like 10 years. Like he went after J. Cole and Drake, like in like a rap cypher back in 2013. Like he's been trying to start beef with these guys and they never take him up on it. So it's like, if they're not taking him up on it, does it not technically make him the best, right? So long story short, J. Cole responded with a diss track like two days ago and he sounded conflicted because he was like like in the song he basically like i like like i like kendrick like i respect this dude but it wasn't like a diss it was like if you're gonna diss him diss him don't like pay him respect as you're dissing him and then today or i guess last night he apologized like he was at some festival and he was like <laughs> like that's not me like he felt bad about it basically <laughs> and it's like Where's the spirit of competition that we used to have in hip hop? Like, it just hurts my soul. And then you have J. Cole fans saying, which is good to see two men, you know, come together and put the petty squabbles behind them. It's like, it's not a petty squabble, it's competition. Like, imagine saying that after somebody loses the NBA finals. Like, well, I, I, well I'm just happy to see them come together at the end. No, we want competition. No, no. Yeah. No, this, I mean, so this carries over to basketball, right? Like, sometimes yeah. people complain about how friendly these guys have gotten and they want to see them compete more. Exactly. Um, I was not able to follow the story. Like I'll tell you this, my timeline has been filled with this stuff and WrestleMania stuff over the last couple days, few days, week, whatever. And I'm just like, I, I don't know what's going on now. I used to be actually, I used to be into both of these things. I, I was telling my students the other day, back in my day in high school, I listened to rap. I was Eminem and 50 Cent and Tupac and all of, all of that. Uh, I just don't listen to music anymore. I listen to podcasts. And then I used to watch wrestling back in the WCW and it was WWF then, then they got sued or whatever. And, and I just haven't watched it as much anymore. So my long story for me short is my timeline has been filled with stuff that I just have no idea what's going on. Um, we do get some, you know, we had some great, did you get a, <laughs> Wes says I can't mute enough words to avoid WrestleMania on my feed. <laughs> he said unsuccessful so far. That is so true. Oh, I probably shouldn't say this. Um, I've tried to figure out how to do this with baseball on my feed, but I don't think I can do it to get like I just don't watch baseball, and it's nothing against the Tigers, it's nothing against the MLB, any of that. Like, I just don't have the bandwidth to follow baseball enough to even know who the say, players are. You know what I mean? And so, like, I just don't want to see it, but I don't want to unfollow people who cover both teams. You know, I'm not going to unfollow Johnny Kane because he's transitioning to baseball season. I just have tried to figure out, like, how do I not have to see this stuff anymore? Because I have no interest in it. But uh, Amari, did you get a chance to watch the women's game? So let's let's transition into basketball here a little bit. Uh, you know, some great Final Four games, a really nice national championship game. South Carolina women, shout out them, Don Staley, the whole crew. They were awesome. Obviously, Caitlin Clark's career, Angel Reese, like all, Juju, all of these. Um, some big-time games, big-time performances. Did you get a chance to watch some of that? So I caught bits and pieces of, like, okay. both of the last two games, unfortunately. Uh, the first one, like, last Friday was right in the middle of the Pistons' uh, 
uh, Grizzlies game. So I think I caught like the last five minutes of that. So I did see the ending and the and the controversial foul call on the moving screen, which yeah. actually I, I thought it was a bad call, but it actually Okay, was. so no, I, I want to talk about that. Yeah. Can, can we settle in there for yeah, a second? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I tend to agree with people a little bit. One, it was a foul. I think it's yeah. an offensive foul. I actually thought, and I'm not like patting myself on the back. Everybody knows I take tons of L's and I'm wrong all the time. I thought in the moment it looked like a foul. Like just yeah. as you're watching, I saw that action coming. So that's where my eyes were. It, they weren't on the ball. I thought it was a moving screen live. If you slow it down, it's definitely a moving screen. We don't make calls in slow motion. So there's an argument there. The argument I want to discuss with you is I see a lot of people saying, yes, it's an offensive foul, but the refs can't call it in that moment. They should swallow their whistle, those type of things. So I just want to throw back, though, well, what if she sets an illegal screen and knocks the girl on the floor and now right. the offense gets a wide open shot? Where is the line? And we love to complain about officials all the time, Amari. Well, now you're moving the goalpost within a game. When do the rules change? Is it under a minute? Is it under five minutes? Is it only on the last possession? Like people say, swallow the whistle. Well, a couple of years ago, LeBron got hacked across the arm by Jason Tatum and they swallowed the whistle. And then everybody was mad. They didn't make the call. So I just think it's, it's a delicate situation to say, Oh, you can't make that call in that moment. I'm like, well, where do you draw the line? I think it gets a little bit uh, gray there. No doubt. I think what's unique about that call is that live and then the replay it almost looked like two different screens but you could not really see the angle of her feet and her left leg watching live so when sure. you see the replay and the angle the ref had it was, it was clear as day and you could even see her teammates on the bench where like they knew what was about to happen like it <laughs> yeah. was not a legal screen i think to me that one uh crosses the threshold of you have to call that but uh, there are maybe some Tiki Taki calls where, okay, if it's with a physical game, you let contact happen both ways. Like, that's one thing, right? But I think in that situation where it's that blatant of an illegal screen, it does kind of ruin the pacing of the game a bit. And nobody wants to see a game decided by the whistle. But with that, to me, that file just crossed the threshold of, well, maybe there's some gray area here. I think there's always going to be like some what of a lose lose scenario if you're a ref in that scenario yeah but the reality is that for me that one just crossed the threshold if it needed to be called and that's pretty much it i mean i think the biggest argument is and i'm sure people could go back and take clips and screenshots throughout the game if they were allowing those things to happen throughout the game and then mm. called it in that moment then i don't agree with it at all right like keep calling the game and as wes says either decision impacts the outcome so if you're going to impact the outcome impact it in the way the rule says it should be. I, I kind of agree with that. I just think sometimes we can go a little too far with, oh, you can't make that call in that moment. And I'm like, okay, well now like you're completely refing the game differently just because of the moment. Maybe some people believe that. Like I do think there's some nuance in these things. That's why we love sports. Uh, one other thing before we get to the Pistons, I watched three movies over the last few days. I want to see if you've watched. Well, I watched 10 Cloverfield Lane. That was your suggestion. I, mm -hmm. I already told you that. We talked about that a little bit. I watched The Game, which is from like the 90s. I don't know if you've seen that one. And then I watched Tenet. Have you seen either of the other two other than 10 Cloverfield Lane? No, I have not. Okay, so we uh, can't talk about it. Okay. Yeah, like I've heard the game is good. Like Tenet, I don't know why I never saw Tenet. It was during the pandemic, and I saw mixed reviews on it, and it was just tough for me to sit down and watch anything during the pandemic that was longer than like an hour. So I was just like, I don't know if I want to sit back and watch this okay. Uh, who was invited? Uh, the, the guy that did Interstellar and uh, Batman. Yeah, yeah, all I know is it, it ended up being time travel stuff, yeah. and I was super, super Christopher cool. Nolan. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Wes said you skipped Shutter Island is a travesty, Bryce. I've watched Shutter Island. I know. I just don't want to watch it again. Yeah, yeah. I've watched it. So, um, time travel stuff just it, it's it's so much. So, okay, this is long as we've just talked nonsense to start a podcast. But at the end of the day, <laughs> the Detroit Pistons only have four games less in the season. It's I mean to be honest, they're playing all sorts of different players. It's, it's crazy. What we are going to do guys is 
after we get through just some, you know, things that's happened the last week or so, we're going to go back and revisit our New Year's resolutions that we made, uh, you know, right after the turn of the calendar. And we're going to kind of see where those things are. Have any of them started to happen over the second half of the season? You know, where do we think they're going as we go into the off season and next year and all of that? So that will be fun. Yeah, YouTube user says the Pistons are currently nonsense. <laughs> I mean, listen, I'm sure our listenership is down anyway. If you are with us, we appreciate you. Hit that like, subscribe, leave a rating, review, all of that stuff. But I, I assume that we can hopefully made you smile the last 10 minutes as we talked some non piston stuff as well. So, I mean, the biggest news over the last week, I guess, is the Malachi Flynn 50-point game, Omari. Like, uh, I heard someone say they got a text message that somebody had scored 50 points and they were eating dinner. I think this was Zach Lowe. And the person he's eating dinner with said, Zach, I'll give you a hundred guesses on who scored 50 tonight. And Lowe goes, you could have given me, you know, 400, which yeah. I mean, honestly, there's, it's not just the Pistons that are playing, you know, random dudes that are, you know, and shout out these guys taking advantage of their opportunities. So Malachi did it obviously hasn't been great since, but was kind of like a cool moment for him. A, a guy that's been around the league this season with trades and all that um, really took advantage of his opportunity that night. No doubt. Yeah. That was one of the, I mean, I'll say one of that was for sure, the most unexpected 50-point game anybody's probably ever watched, including me. I've now covered two the other ones, Sadiq Bay. So <laughs> it's just funny that, you know, probably two of the most obscure 50-point scores ever have happened, I think, in back-to-back -back seasons now. Or maybe Sadiq's was two years ago. Anyway, he had 19 points at halftime, and it was just a good game for him. I think his previous season, I was like 16 or 17. But then he added 12 more in the third. And then he hit, I think, two threes early in the fourth. And it's like, wait, is he, is he about to score 50? <laughs> uh, so it's it's funny because Kane also had a really good game in uh, Atlanta earlier this season where I think he might have finished with 44 or 45. So I don't know what it is about State Farm Arena. But, I mean, it, like at this point in the season when you have so many guys playing big minutes who are not going to be back next season and most of the core guys are shut down, Kane's missed the last three uh, so we're really sort of crawling to the finish line now. Something like that's a, a fun story, right? I mean, Malachi Flynn comes out. He has the night of his life. Uh, doesn't quite end in a, a win, but he was the best player on the floor that night. And it kind of reminds me that it's the NBA. Uh, all these guys are really, really good. Uh, and just even, I guess, quote, unquote, the guy at the end of the bench can heat up and have a really big night like that. So shout out to Malachi Flynn. Thank you for giving us something <laughs> new to talk about given how dire the team has been over the last week. Yeah. I mean, some positive vibes from that one. And you're right. Like, that's what I thought as I watched that as well is like, this is a guy that when the trades happen, people are like, they don't even mention him. Whenever he went from Toronto to New York, people didn't even mention him. When he went from New York, New York to Detroit, people didn't even mention him. Like at the end of the day, the dude is still really talented. Like it is just a reminder. I remember watching like one reason I'm such a big Malachi Flynn fan is my very first summer league I went to before it was actually when you and I connected, like whenever the very first time I went out there, we didn't know each other ahead of time. We recorded together, all of that. He was playing in summer league when he was incredible. Like he was one of those, you see these guys at summer league, right? That just shouldn't be there. They're way better than everybody else. And that's what Malachi Flynn looked like whenever I watched him. So have always been a big fan. YouTube user says, Bryce, you're a Flynn fan. Do you bring him back? Like, I think Malachi Flynn is an NBA player. Like, that's what I'll say. Does he make sense for the Pistons? I don't know. Whenever you have all these guards and Sasser and all of that stuff, he's got to make more shots. I put it in my notes all the time that I put on the sub stack. So I, I think he is an NBA player. I don't think he's as good as a 50-point performance. I also don't think he's as bad as what's happened in the two games since. Also, Amari. Congrats to you, four-year anniversary of you covering the Detroit yeah. Pistons. Um, just another reminder that we came in, obviously, this is like your life. And for me, it's just a passion project. I like to say it's more than a hobby. But we both came in when this thing kind of started. And all we've seen so far is a whole bunch of not winning basketball. And, and I'm hoping very soon for us, we can have a podcast and be covering a team that wins and is a little more competitive. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, one, I mean, it's just crazy to hit four years at the free press. Like, I started during the pandemic, and that first year and a half is still, like, a blur in my head. So, I always feel like it's a year later than what it should be. It feels like three years, maybe. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's cool to pass that milestone. And we've had the pod for, what, two, two and a half years of those now? All like, I know is it's yeah. 118 episodes. And, I mean, so... 
I do get paid to do the pod. So this is how I know. I think the last thing that I put in, like my invoice or whatever was the 24th. So, um, it was right at the end of the season, whenever we started. Yeah. Cause I remember thinking, I think, it, so it would just be a little over, we just hit a little over two years is what we did over two years. It's been awesome, man. And hopefully we'll get a, a, a team that is worth talking about more, especially this time of year going. Cause we have these last few pods. And it's just like, man, like, I feel like we're all kind of crawling to the finish line at this well, point. Like, I'll tell you, th- I'll tell you this though. We're going to have an interesting off season, right? Like yeah. we're going to have a high draft pick and there's cap space, no matter what they do with it, there's cap space to talk about. I'll, I'll tell you like the Houston Rockets way better position than the Detroit Pistons, yeah. right? Everybody would agree with that way better. Me and Sam did their off season preview the other day. And I'm like, I think if I'm the Rockets, I'd kind of just run it back. I would have like the most boring off season ever, bring that team back, kind of figure things out. Mm. Point being, if you're a Rockets fan or a Rockets content creator, you don't have all of these things to talk about, right? Like where yeah. we still do Cade, Ivy, draft pick, who fits, who doesn't, who do you sign, who do you trade for, et cetera, et cetera. So at the very least, like just like the deadline with all of these moves with the how, what are we up to now, Amari? 31 players, 32 players. That yeah, 31. Play we have plenty of players to talk about. Like they give it. How about Tosan running out of games? Like I was like, why is Tosan not starting? And then the broadcast, and he had ran out of his two way yeah. games. So it's which just- is a really dumb rule this late in the season. It's like <laughs> there's no G League team he could play for. The G League season <laughs> is over. So you're just like this weird, like no man's land limbo. I feel like when the G League season ends, like whatever that that requirement is, like the 50 game limit. For games you're active even like not even games you're you playing but active like there could be some more flexibility there there's no reason why a guy like tosan can't finish the season out um when there's no g league for him to play he's just he's just chilling to have, like let him play yeah so like april right like in, in starting in april or something that rule should just go away i just yeah i look through these names man and i'm just like wondering like who's the guy we forget played on this roster five years from now you know is it jalen newell noel who's played two, yeah. probably gonna end up with six games you know, Gallo, Metu played 10. Uh, Shake Milton only played four. Grimes has only played six, crazy enough as that is. Monte Morris only played six. Taj Gibson, you know, Cazalone won. I, I just, it's crazy the list of names. And we're going to look back on this and just, again, just like all of the players this team went through and not just because of the trade deadline deals, but. Um, everything that's happened from there. Is there anything else before we go to break and then get into this? Anything else from the last week or the upcoming week? Because quite honestly, Amari, this is probably the last time we talk about actual games. I don't know what we'll do next week yet, but the team's last game is on Sunday. We'll record Monday or Tuesday, probably talk draft or off season or something like that. Is there any takeaways, any guys that have caught your attention? Like YouTube user said, would you bring Metu back? I kind of like him. Um, You know, anything like that, any final takeaways before we kind of just move on? Because I have a feeling when this season's over, we're moving into the offseason. Yeah, no. I mean, I think this is probably our last, like, end of the finish line type pot. Because, of course, our last game is Sunday in San Antonio. Um, I'll be in Dallas and San Antonio this weekend for the last two. And then... Uh, I have like a 5.30 a.m. flight out of San Antonio to get back so I could be back in Detroit by like 9.30 uh, because a lot of times they do end of season. Oh, yeah. uh, Like exit interviews with the media the next day. Uh, Although in this case, it's tough because it's it's, it's a 3 p.m. game next Sunday. Uh, So ideally you get like an 8 or 9 p.m. flight out, but they didn't have any. So uh, we're still not sure exactly when they're going to start to exit interviews. But of course, we'll do a pod, you know, either the evening of or the day after that happens and we're about to get into the big picture stuff soon so uh, we can go ahead and go into segment two unless you have any last words you want to say about this this riveting part of the season we're in and we're just going to go back and we're just going to look at our new year's resolutions for uh you know for the back half of this season and how off we were because I'm looking at them now and it's like, yeah, these did not age very well. No, th- it's, it's going to be really good. What Wes essentially copy and pasted the outline, I believe, yeah. or our notes. And so we're going to be able to talk about it. Um, and some of it really applies. So it'll be very interesting to go ahead and do now. Cause again, I think once the season ends, draft talk will really start to pick up there off season. 
I know people have been like email me and DMing me about free agents and stuff like that. Um, big cheese, like even right here, like a really appreciate it. Pick a group of three free agents that you would sign this off season. I feel like maybe we want to just save some of that stuff. So, yeah. uh, you know, starting even next week, we might get into that stuff. I have some names of guys that I'm really interested in, but I feel like maybe we want to hold on to that for just a little bit. So let's go to a break. When we come back, we'll start with our Cade Cunningham New Year's resolution, see where we are right, where we are wrong, where maybe it can keep going. All right, we're back with segment two, and we're going to dive into our New Year's resolutions from last season. And we're going to open it up, you know, with the most important, you know, factor in this rebuild, Cade Cunningham. Uh, we had him... Continued health was the 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 first one. Uh, you know, just seeing him close the season out strong. Where are we with that now? Just given that he had played most of the season, but obviously now he's missed three games, and we're waiting to see if he comes back. Yeah, so I think we had continued health because this yeah. was for so just so everybody, this was January first, twenty twenty four, like right after that. So this was you know how many ever games into the season at that time, Cade had played thirty three games and thirty five minutes, and I, I believe he had played every single game. He played the first 36, missed 9 of 10 starting on January 9th. So right after we recorded, uh, maybe we were bad luck. And then obviously has missed some games here recently. And I believe Aruna says, does Cade get to the 65 game most improved threshold? Like he, I don't think he's going to get to 65. I believe he's at what right now? 62, Amari? I think he's at 62 or 63. Uh, I asked Monty before the game on Saturday in uh, Brooklyn if Cade was – going to come back and he said he's working to come back this season he's at 62 so they have four games left and he needs to play three of their last four uh, they had an off day yesterday uh they get a practice day today so you know maybe he's able to, to work himself back and that's bad i guess we'll actually know pretty soon here maybe before the pod ends hopefully uh i'm, I'm gonna check the injury report in 20 minutes but yeah we'll see i mean i think he can play three of the last four uh, maybe they hold him out of one of the back-to-back -back games but the thing about that is you're either being held out of the season finale or his homecoming in Dallas. So, you know, I'm not sure how you approach that, but I think he could get three of the last four if he really is rehabbing to get back. I feel like if he was shut down, you know, Monty probably wouldn't be hoping to get, to get him back at this point. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I hadn't really considered him in the most improved player. And I just did this. Like I spent all day mm -hmm. today um, prepping this for an episode tomorrow in terms of all of these awards and where we're at. But, you know, looking at his numbers, they don't like pop off at you, but the, the efficiency, like his field goal percentage is up. His three point percentage is up on a little more volume. Free throw attempts are up. Free throw percentage is even up. Rebounds are the biggest thing that is down, but his assists are up. So, I mean, I think there's maybe, I don't think he would win it at all. Like I don't think he's in actually winning a conversation, but could he get in there and get some votes? Sure. So I, I think that's one. How, how do you feel? Like I'm not sitting here worried about Cade Cunningham's health. I realize he's missed some games. We also have to understand where this team is at right now. It's been a long season. He has played 62 games, 33 and a half minutes a night, taking a ton of usage, you know, coming off, you know, a, an off season or last season, at least where he had to, to miss as much time as he did. I don't think I'm like at a one, but I'm definitely not like on high alert with his ability to play and his health. Are, are you, are there any lingering concerns for you going into the off season and into next year? Yeah. I, I'll say I'm somewhat in the middle. I'll lead off by saying I'm, I'm, I'm against Kate being in the most improved discussion for the same reason why I was against the job being at it a few years ago, which is that they were the second to first overall picks. And I feel like when you come sure. with those expectations, that's fair, you know, reaching the threshold of where you expect is, I just feel, I feel like philosophically the most, the most improved should go to a guy like a Naz Reed or like a Tyrese Maxey. Uh, although Naz Reed, I guess, is a really late <laughs> boomer this season as far as being up for that. But guys you don't expect or you know don't anticipate to make that type of leap and then get to it. Although Kade has gotten a lot better, uh, but I would say, yeah, I'm somewhere in the middle as far as the severity of this the issue. Of course, he had the surgery last season. This is his first year back, and um, you know he ended up exiting the first quarter of that game against Denver, I think in the first quarter. And he's just had some lingering soreness since then. Uh, so I believe he had actually had a stretch where he had played all but one game up to a certain point after he came back. Uh, I'm looking at it now. Uh, well, one, two, yeah, he had missed two games 
he's missed a few games. So he's missed one, two, three, four. He's not up to seven games missed, uh, I believe, since that initial injury. And if he doesn't come back this season, now you're at 11, and he actually ends up playing fewer games than he did as a rookie, which is when I think people first started to have dur- the, the durability debate with him when he played 64 games. So I think at the very least, you want to see him top that 64 and get to the point where he could qualify for the end of season awards. But at the same time, if he does end up getting shut down and he misses the last seven games of the season, I think you have to have some concern at that point. I think the thing I would want to know is, would he have played if this team was in play in contention, mm-hmm. right? Like if they were in the 11, the 10 even, and they were playing to some sort of postseason or even like just not historically as bad as what they are, would he be playing these games? If the answer is no, he wouldn't have played these games still. If he would have missed these last three games or whatever, if they were jockeying for play in position, then I would definitely like that would raise my concern. I guess for me, I've essentially chalked this up to the season just isn't going great. And so they're not going to push it. If there's even just a little bit, think how many late scratches there's been. Like, I think there was even a game where he warmed up and then didn't, you know, end up playing and all of that. So uh, let's go to the next thing. One thing we said was three point shooting. So at the time, Amari, he was 42% on unguarded threes, 31% on guarded. Those are both catch and shoot numbers, 29% on dribble. Now for the season, he is, 42% still on unguarded, up to 35% on guarded, and up to 32% on dribble threes, 37% on 5.2 attempts per game since January 1st. To me, those are three-point shooting numbers I can live with. If Cade Cunningham does that for the rest of his his career, I think you're, you're pretty happy with that. Maybe the dribble percentage could go up a little bit more, but 42% on unguarded threes, that's all I need him to do off the ball. Five attempts a game since the start, turn of the calendar. I wouldn't mind getting him to six, but I'm happy with that. And it's at 37%. Those are encouraging three-point percentage shooting numbers for me. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he's really made a mini leap as a shooter this season after a cold start. And what's been impressive to me is that even though you look at the numbers that he's shooting officially a 5.2 attempts per game, uh, since January 1st, so more than half of the season, now it's probably you know around 47, 48 games of worth of, of sample size at this point. I still feel like there's so much room for him to grow. Like, sure. it doesn't seem like he takes that many threes. Like, 5.2 Great. is a pretty healthy number, but it doesn't seem like he takes a lot of threes. Um, he's been shooting off the catch, I think, a bit more than off the dribble, but you can still see him improve his footwork, uh, you know, get to a step back a bit more, which we've seen flashes of, but not a whole lot. So there's still things he can do to really make – an even bigger leap, I think, next season. But the main thing he has to do this season was just get above water. And he's done that for the vast majority of the year now. And I would say I'm about the point to where I really have a few question marks about his shooting. I think at the very least, he'll be at least an average to above average guy. Yeah, and remember, he was a good three-point shooter coming out of college. And so mm-hmm. you have you know a year of that. I think I've even gone back to his high school numbers, and it was solid there. He has to be able to shoot. And I know the, the very anti Cade Cunningham people – always point to the athleticism. Well, the thing is, if he shoots the ball well, that forces tougher closeouts. It doesn't allow people to go under ball screens, those things. And so it's just a little bit of difference of, hey, a few extra percentage points, which he got to this year, it opens up some of that driving. Now, I still think the finishing around the basket is going to be huge for him, adding a little bit more bulk and even some of the finesse finishes. So one thing also that we had here was getting the right roster around him. So we'll talk bigger picture with this soon. I kind of want to just point out, I think this is his team, Amari. I think at the end of the day, the most important thing moving forward, you've hitched your wagon to Kate. Like to me, he was the guy in the organization. You're probably going to give him a max, whatever rookie extension, whatever that is this off season to keep him here. You've hitched your wagon to him. I'm personally okay with that. You have to make every decision built around making him as good as possible. One, do you agree? Two, do you think we saw a little bit of progress with the process of that, with bringing in Simone Fontecchio, the idea of what Quentin Grimes was supposed to be, et cetera? Yeah, uh, I think there's been an acknowledgement that you need a certain archetype of player around Kate. Uh, You know, I think the issue coming into the season was – just the lack of data you had on his play style, right? Like, could he be this heliocentric guy where no matter who's around him, he's going to be able to create something, or is he going to need a little bit more help, you know, spacing-wise, which 
you know, like most players need, especially, you know, point guards. That's no knock on him by any means. But I think this season answered that pretty definitively where you do want the ball in his hands, but he absolutely needs spacing. And he's not necessarily a guy who's just going to be able to twirl his way to the rim, you sure. know, which very few guys could do. I mean, Luca does it every night, but that's, you know, he, he might have the greatest footwork of all time as far as NBA. And, and a completely goes, so. different body than what yeah. Kate has right now. So, you know, it's not really a fair comparison, but you have that data now. And I think you also know that you have to really invest in that position and you can't just try to get just enough. Like you bring in Joe Harris and, you know, Bogey and Burks and, you know, two of those guys could shoot, you know, of course, Joe Harris, you know, was just kind of struggled coming back from the lower body injuries he's had, but you have no defense at all and nobody else steps up. So you've been banking on internal development that just hasn't happened. So you have to go out and you have to spend that money and you have to get guys. I think Quentin Grimes is still a bit of an unknown given that uh, he didn't shoot the ball well. He was battling knee soreness. So, you know, perhaps there's a correlation there. Uh, but Simone Fontecchio, he came in, he fit in perfectly. Like he really takes pressure off of Kate. I think in all areas, he even had a little, a little bit of playmaking. And this offseason, that's got to be the priority. Uh, you're looking at it as, you know, we want to get Kate locked in. You know, I think at this point, he's shown that he could be the type of leader you need. And then with that, you know, bring back Fontecchio and then see, uh, see who else you can get. Um, I, I think what's interesting about this is that none of this stuff is like new stuff. I think you probably do come in and that Kate would probably need it. But, uh, you know, I think after this season, that obviously becomes a much more pressing priority to do it um, uh, ASAP now. No, I, I think there's a fairness to like, we really know he needs the spacing though, right? Yeah. Like he, he may end up being what we all, you know, thought he was going to be when he was the number one pick and what he was projected to be and all of that. But there is a little bit of context. Like there's some guys that are so good. You can almost put anybody you want around them and they're going to make it work, right? They're going to figure it out. There's very few of those guys. Then the next tier of guys I feel like are, okay, they can make this work, but you do kind of have to have the right pieces around them. And I'm glad you brought up the spacing because some guys don't need that spacing as much mm -hmm. as others. And maybe K doesn't five years from now, but right now for him to be successful, I feel like he does. Went into the season. And one thing we talked about was at least getting answers at the end of the day, you can't go through this whole year and not have a better feel on things. I think we do have a better feel on wh who Kate is, how good he can be. Do you let the, him, like, do you give the keys to him? I think he's shown enough that you feel like you have to do that. And the only other option is you trade him and completely start over. And like, I don't think anybody has the stomach for that. And, you know, Wes and I talked about this. I think he got a question about trading Cade for a boatload of draft picks. And it's like, okay, sure. You might as well trade everybody else. You're starting over. If people want to sign up for that, that's great. Well, where's the guarantee you get a Cade level player through all of those picks and, and everything else? So I just think at the end of the day, whether people want to believe in it or not, I personally do. You 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 have Cade Cunningham. You got to move forward with it. You know, we, we spent 12 minutes here on Cade, rightfully so, because in the, the day, that's who matters. Let's talk about the guy that could or could not be playing alongside of him here in the long term future. I'm not saying the, the, the near future. Jaden Ivey. One thing real quick. I do want to give Jaden Ivey some love for playing through all of these games. Mm -hmm. And maybe other people don't. They're going to say, hey, he gets paid millions of dollars to go play basketball. I get it. Jaden Ivey was a top five pick. Cade's not playing. And again, this isn't a shot at any of these guys. I'm sure they're all real legit injuries. So it truly. Cade's not playing. Stu's not playing. Asar's not playing. Duran's not playing. Fontecchio's not playing. Grimes not playing. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jay and I be still going out there and playing. And I feel like with good energy, good intensity, he had the one really, really bad game three or four games ago. He responded pretty well after those. I just want to give him some love for that. That may not mean anything big picture. Maybe nobody else cares about it. I did want to give him some love for that. First and foremost for Jay and Ivy, Amari, rim finishing. So let me give you the numbers and you tell me where you're at with this. So Synergy has him at 52% at the rim in the half court. That's up 5% from his rookie season. B-ball reference, zero to three feet. He's went. He's at 65%, up 7% from his rookie season. NBA.com restricted area by month, Omari. 64% on three and a half attempts, then up to 72% in November on three and a half attempts. Then he went down almost 20% in December, back up to almost 70% in January on under four attempts. And then here are the last three months, February. 53% on 4.5, March, 
51% on 2.9, and then not a lot of games here in April, but still 48% on 6.3. Where are you at with Jaden Ivey's rim finishing? Because I feel like we're just up and down roller coaster ride. Yeah, he's been a different player uh, since All Star Weekend for whatever reason, and like you just look at his numbers and they've just cratered since then. I think going into Saturday, he had or maybe Friday. I checked last week. I can't remember which game, but he was shooting like thirty five point seven percent in like twenty one games uh, in between All Star Weekend and that game, and. It just, like it seems like just some of the offensive improvement we saw early on has kind of fallen off. Like I thought he was picking his spots at the rim better. Uh, you know, I think he's leaning back more on the tunnel vision. We saw more when he was a, a rookie. Uh, the playmaking I think has regressed a bit. We're turning the ball over a lot, but you're not necessarily not necessarily seeing him make the reads that you want to see him make as a lead ball handler. I think it hasn't helped that he really has not been staggered with Cade much. We've seen it in spurts, but. The coaching staff always goes away from it eventually uh, to where even now in the season before Kate was out, uh, you were still seeing Ivy come out at the six minute mark and then Kate at the nine minute mark. So maybe Ivy hasn't gotten all the reps he's needed this season to show what he could do apart from Kate. But the bottom line for me is that when Ivy's not scoring the ball well, he's not really giving you anything else. And there's been a lingering question of, is this your future backcourt? Can these guys play together? But the reality is that at least one of them has got to be a plus defender. Right now, neither of them are, but I think K is ahead of Ivy. Uh, you need at least, ideally, both of those guys to be plus shooters. K is getting there. You know, Ivy's still been really streaky. Uh, like, what does Ivy do that makes K's life easier, I think, is the long-term question. And you know K could play alongside those 3 and D guys. Ivy's a very different archetype, and he's going to have to improve in areas. He's currently struggled at a bit to be able to fulfill that role. So that's the question with film is you see the efficiency decline, but the issue is that even with that, you need other things you can lean on when the shot's not falling and he's not quite there yet in his career. I think what you just said makes a lot of sense. I disagree that he has to be a knockdown three-point shooter. I disagree yeah. with that. Um now, does it, you know, we just talked about floor spacing for Cade and, and all of that. You know, you would have to have some other guys, but I disagree in general that he has to be like a 40% catch and shoot guy. What I agree with is he has to score the basketball. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you said there is what I definitely agree with. If he's not scoring the basketball at a high rate, and to me, that's option one, get downhill. Option two, get downhill. Option three, get to the mid range and make a floater or pull up. Option four, catch and shoot a three. So like, again, I've had some issues with this process more than anything recently in the number of threes. And, th and this will get into a bigger conversation of, and Muhammad says it here, he goes, Ivy has been very disappointing. Am I crazy that I'd be willing to give up for a guy like Grayson Allen, hypothetically speaking? Do we need more than that for the backcourt? Muhammad, we're not going to dive into that, but I think that's going to be the big question this offseason in terms of, is it Jaden Ivy makes sense? Or are you better off having a Grayson Allen who shoots 40% from three, maybe doesn't offer a whole lot else, is going to really compete on the defensive end and all of that. And I'm starting to lean that that's the way the organization fields. I feel like Cade Cunningham feels that way to an extent, but I do think that Jaden Ivey could be successful playing off of Cade Cunningham. I think that that's real, but to your point, Jaden has to make better than 50% at the rim whenever he does get downhill. I think some of his mid-range stuff definitely has to get better. The three-point percentage, I was going to look. So he was 35% on catch and shoot whenever we did this originally. He is now 33% on catch and shoot. So, you know, those numbers didn't get any better. And we've seen how up and down he can be with that as well. So I don't think it's solely Jaden Ivey has to shoot the ball better, Amari. Jaden Ivey has to score the basketball better. Some of that is on him, in my opinion. Some of that could be on the coaching staff and the way they use him. But some of that definitely is on Jaden Ivey. No doubt. And the other thing with that, and we're getting towards it in the segment too, so I'll be quick. But. With Ivy, you're going to have to make bigger decisions with him at some point anyway, Correct. because he'll be extension eligible next offseason along with Duran. And the reality is that you look around the league and there aren't that many teams that are built around two guards that have had any sustained success. You know, the Hawks haven't done it with Trey Young and Jonte Murray. Both of these guys have made all-star teams individually. Uh, pretty much all of the truly elite teams are built around some combination of an elite big and an elite guard or an elite wing and an elite guard, and they're just getting by at the point guard position. So I think that's the the overall thing the Pistons have to figure out. You have a 6'6 six, six guard, a 6'4 guard. Neither of these guys are small. 
but if you invest the max into K, you know, what is IV cost? And do you still have what you need at the big position to be able to handle that down the road? And at some point, it's just going to be weighing priorities, right? Like, you know, we have this area covered. We need to invest elsewhere. So that's where the point the organization is getting to, where you have to start making these judgment calls sooner rather than later. And to me, that's one of the bigger questions of the offseason. If you want to make that big offseason splash, uh, you don't have a draft pick you can trade before, I think, 2028. Uh, can you do that while still holding on to guys like Ivy and Duran? And that's the, the question. You know, they're going to have to make some roster shakeups. So uh, who's going to be shaken up is what we're going to have to wait and see. That's interesting, man. Like, I look through the standings. Like, the Celtics, it's definitely not the – like, listen, that pack court is really good. Like, they're just – perfectly constructed but the yeah. bucks Giannis and lillard the magic have two wing forwards but it's not backcourt guys the knicks your best player is a guard the off ball guard is just an elite floor spacer this mm -hmm. year and dante divincendo that just shot lights out the Cavs. i would say most people don't think that that's worked that's one where they're trying to rely on their two best players being in the backcourt I don't mm -hmm. think it's hit at the level people wanted. The Pacers just went out and got a wing forward. Mm -hmm. The Sixers, backcourt and frontcourt. I'm going to skip to the West. Timberwolves, backcourt and frontcourt. The Nuggets, same thing. Even the Thunder, their three best players. Guard, wing, big man. Clippers are wings. The Mavericks are probably the only team, right? Yeah. Like They're the one team where their undoubtedly two best players are in the backcourt. Like Even the Suns. I know it's Booker and Beal, but if you, you say they're KD. yeah, if you say you're their two best players, it's Booker and KD. The Pelicans start with Zion and then whoever, the mm -hmm. Kings, Sabonis and Monk, or not Monk, I just like Malik Monk, De'Aaron Fox, excuse yeah. me. Um, you know, and then you'd have to go to the Warriors from so that it's it's interesting. Maybe it's just not a the the right way to build out a team in general. I will also say, and I didn't love Jaden Ivey coming off the bench at the time. Just because maybe he doesn't fit with Cade doesn't mean there's it's impossible for him to still be a part of this thing moving forward. We'll leave it I at agree. that. You know, we got plenty of time to talk about that as we get into the offseason. We do need to go to a break, though. Mm -hmm. When we come back, Amari, we'll get into Jalen Duran. All right, we're back with segment three, and we still have a few left, so we can try to go a little bit faster. Yep, yep. Uh, we have Jalen Duran. The top one was just injury prevention uh he's i think at that time it was the ankle stuff right mm -hmm. and so yeah like he was dealing with some ankle stuff at the time um i think he had just returned because i want to say he was out around new year's for a bit um you know if i'm remembering correctly uh, but he has some you know ankle stuff as a rookie too and i think that's just been a lingering concern with him uh which granted he has still missed some time since then so i don't know if he silenced those concerns all the way uh just bryce where are you as far as that and just sort of the recurring issues we've seen as far as his durability he did play 40 straight after he returned mm -hmm. from that so he came back right after christmas played 40 straight games and then he's missed what four of the last nine or something like that mm -hmm. so um you know, I don't think I'm overly concerned. I think with big guys, there's always a little bit. Um, he played 67 games as a rookie. He's at 59 right now. I don't know if we'll see him again this year. So he's going to be right around 60 or so for both of these seasons. It, it's something I'm a little bit nervous. I, I would say I'd probably be a little more nervous about Cade because we've seen it over multiple years. If it happens again next season, you know, like then it's something I'm, I'm a little more worried about. There are definitely other things that I want to see um, from Jalen Duran, though, uh, besides worrying about the injury stuff and, and keeping him on the floor. No doubt. Uh, the other, I think the biggest question with him going forward, as we talk about, uh, you know, elite bigs, you know, sort of dominating playoff teams right now is his rim protection. Yep. Uh, you know, opposing players were scoring 67, uh, percent against them at the time. You look at guys like Chet, Rudy Gobert, uh, Porzingis, they're in the low sixties. Uh, I'm not sure where his rim protection number is now, but I do know just eye test wise. I don't know. That, if that was the whole that year. Was the current one. Oh, yeah, so that, that was the whole year. Yeah. So I, yeah, that was updated today. Okay. And that's, uh, I think that's in the restricted area. Yeah. So, so you, we really have not seen the growth there. Uh, we're really, I think his bet, his three best defensive games of the year were probably those first three. Like he's had maybe a couple of games since then where he reached that same level of all around impact, but, uh, going into the offseason, I would say that that's by far uh, his most important area for growth. Yeah, I agree. I think it's something we have to see. People will be quick to point out how young he is, and people are absolutely right. 
I am more than willing to wait and see what it looks like next year. But we do need to see it at one point. And my biggest reason for this is he doesn't space the floor offensively. Mm -hmm. So like if you don't space the floor offensively and you're not like an anchor of the defense, I realize he rebounds the heck out of the ball and he's a lob threat and all of those things are valuable. But I don't think I trust or believe in him ever spacing the floor. So I really would like to see him be that anchor of the defense. And even the other thing, Amari, going offensively, he hasn't done some of the stuff offensively that I thought he was going to be able to do. He has the same turnover ratio as Victor Wimbenyama. Like, and Victor takes a ton of usage. And so I kind of just looked at big guys, Duran and Wiseman, and I don't mean to like loop Wiseman in here, but are like two of the top three or four guys when it comes to turnover ratio of mm -hmm. big guys. Duran's at 14, Wiseman's at 15.3. You know, somebody like Jarrett Allen's under 10, Nick Claxton's under 10, Aiton and Mobley are right around 10. So bonus, who we know the usage, is at 12.3. So I think even that is going to be something that's important for him is either be able to pass the ball, but definitely don't be turning it over as much as he is. Yeah, he's sort of in a weird spot usage-wise where he's sure. probably dribbling a bit more than you would expect. And, you know, I feel like that's, become a bigger part of his arsenal as the season is going on. Whereas earlier in the season, you were probably seeing a lot of his assists maybe come more out of like dribble handoffs or, you know, just him finding guys in the corners if he's in the paint or whatnot. But it seems like he's been trying to be more of like maybe a primary type guy in some, you sure. know, areas rather than just, you know, handling the secondary playmaking. And he's probably just doing a little bit too much. As far as that, um, you know, I don't know if the Pistons, just because of their overall lack of shooting in general, necessarily have a roster that could make it easier for Duran to have the space he needs, maybe to pull off some of his riskier passes. Uh, and I would say long term, I don't know if I'm super concerned about the turnover issue, just because I think as the Pistons upgrade their roster, it will uh, take more pressure off of Duran, maybe to do certain things. And, you know, Maybe it won't. I don't know. Uh, the turnovers obviously are, are too high, but I forgive some of that just because he's 20. But uh, yeah, like he's been putting the ball on the floor a lot more. And, you know, I don't know if that's helped his efficiency as a passer or scorer uh, in any way. So YouTube user says, give me SAR and make a decision on Duran when he is a restricted free agent. I've been thinking more about this recently, Amari. And so I want to get your thoughts. My kind of idea was whether you whether you get the number one pick or where, like I don't think like Alex Sar is not the automatic number one pick. Mm -hmm. I, I do think he's the number one prospect in this class for me. Now I'm really excited to watch Donovan Klingon tonight because if he dominates Zach Eady, that is really going to raise people's eyebrows. But initially, it was like if you draft Alex Sar, then you have to trade Jalen Duran. I've thought more about this, and I in come the Troy Weaver loves big jokes. Like I, I understand it, but I thought about like the Knicks. One thing I love about the Knicks when they're healthy. You have Mitchell Robinson and Isaiah Hartenstein, mm -hmm. and you're not having to depend on either one of them to play 34 minutes. Like they can balance that. The Mavericks, Derek Lively the second was playing really, really well, and they still went out and got Daniel Gafford. And now they get 48 minutes, no matter what, of, of this real high level play for them, what they need at the center position. And as YouTube user says, Sar could play a little bit at the four. I don't think you want to do that exclusively early in his career, but you could do you know, there's certain matchups where you could do that stuff. I don't even say it has to be SAR. Like, what if you fall to six and Klingon is there? Do you take Klingon? And like, does that mean you have to trade? De like, I'm starting to open up a little bit more to, okay, let's just solidify the center position. And even if that means Jalen Dern is long-term off the bench or, you know, what it only plays 26 minutes and this other guy plays the rest. I don't know. It would be interesting. It was just something I thought about. And then you have to go really hit home runs on the wing and all of that in free agency, obviously, because that's a mess as well. But just just something I thought about. It was interesting. No doubt. I feel like I am confident in the bigs of this draft being impact players than the guards or the wings. Like a guy like Donovan Klingon, I'm just like, this dude is going to be an above average NBA player sure. uh, pretty much from, I think, the day he steps on the court just because of the impact he makes. Uh, defensively, of course, but also the feel he has on offense. Like a guy like that, you pair him with a an all around creator like Cunningham, and I mean, you just see what the chemistry he's had with Duran. But you combine that with, you know, size, a little bit bit of playmaking, their defense, and that really completes 
a, a team. And it's like I said earlier, the defensive Venice area, Duran has to grow in the most. I look at Sar Klingon. There are some really good defensive big prospects in this draft. Yep. If you end up at two or three, you don't want to take a guard, and your wing options are Risa Shea and Cody Williams, which, granted, I think those are two really solid prospects. But upside-wise, I think Sar is probably – uh, the highest upside in that group simply because he's such a a, a toolsy big. So you have to consider that pretty strongly despite all the resources you put into that position. Mike says, has Cody Williams fallen off the top five? He has for me. Um, yeah. But I will say this, Cody Williams wasn't a guy I was super high on coming into the season. He's still in the lottery for me, but um, he's not in my top five, seven, whatever. I mean, listen, I, I'm not saying it's a good idea. It just was something I started to think about today. If you don't believe, like you said, you know, Reese Shea is taking a huge hit from people right now because of his recent play. Mm -hmm. And so my thing is, if you don't believe in these wings, if you don't want to bring in an 18 year old Zach Reese or you don't think the zealous is going to shoot it, or what, you know, if you're worried about connects defense, whatever it is. And it's like, Hey, you know what, as you said, Amari, we just really believe, especially this guy's going to be really, really good defensively. And with SAR, especially some crazy offensive upside and we can make it work. And YouTube user, I think mean, he brought it up initially because then you can have some options around Duran over the next couple of years with what you do with this contract. I don't know. It just was interesting to think about. It was something that, that came up today. Let's talk Asar Thompson. Mm -hmm. Or Hold on real quick. Fun stat I found while I was doing all this. Guess who is number one in the NBA, according to NBA.com, in percentage of loose balls recovered this season? The Detroit Pistons, the which Detroit. is shocking to me. That's and it was, it was like by 5% or something. Like yeah. they were, they had lapped the field in percentage of loose balls recovered. I don't know if that's a completely random stat from year to year. I just thought it was interesting as I was doing some research. Asar Thompson, we put the jump shot. I feel like that's probably still the main thing. Although I will say, I think the handle and some of that stuff has to improve quite a bit as well. Like I, I think I, I almost just want to say the overall offensive package and, and what he's able to bring. And especially I know there's a lot, you know, Koo came on and talked about this. I've had other people that have reached out to me. Like essentially I, I want to put this out, Amari. I made after we record, what is your vibe from the fan base? I feel like if you ask the fan base, who do you want to be the long core duo? Cade and Ivy, Cade and Asar, Cade and Duran. People would say Cade and Asar. Do you agree? I think that would be in the top two uh, for sure. I think I think people are really intrigued about what he could be. Yeah, and so I think if that's the case, obviously the defensive upside is crazy and awesome, and we've already seen it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think the offensive stuff really has to come around. The shooting, yes, but I also think he's – if you're going to do that, then I think he has to be able to handle the ball a little bit as well. I think the the loose handle is something that I wasn't expecting to be quite as bad as what it was this year. Yeah, he's an interesting player in the sense that – He's more of an undersized four, I think, now, but that's really just because of what he doesn't do. And if sure. he does develop the handle a bit and he yep. can knock down open threes, you can pretty much play him, you know, two through five, I think, depending on the lineup and feel really good about it. But yeah, I would I would put the handle and the three point shot on almost equal footing. The, the three ball is still a little bit more important for obvious reasons. I just think when you're shooting 18% as a, a, a wing, he's got to double that. And that's probably a really big ask for any player, uh, you know, but especially a guy who, you know, still probably has a ways to go as far as that. Uh, I felt like he shot the ball a bit better before he played his last game on March 9th. Uh, like he did have out of his last seven games, he hit two three pointers in three of those games, but still only shot about 30% overall. So there's like some marginal improvement there. But again, I just, I wonder, that, like, if he does not figure that jump shot out, let's say he becomes a little bit more of a playmaker, is that still a guy that you could really build around, or does he sort of top out as a solid role player? Well, I think what happens, and I've had this conversation with a lot of people about Asar, is I'm like, well, what if he doesn't shoot it? Oh, well, then you just go get a floor spacing five man. I'm like, well, yeah. now we're building the roster not just around Cade, but now we have to build it around what Asar can and cannot do as well. Yeah. And, and I realize that every team has to do that to an extent, but – Man, it'd be nice if you didn't have to say, hey, we have to have a floor spacing five because our four man or three man or whatever he ends up being can't space the floor at all. Now, the one nice thing for Asar is he passes the ball ideally mm -hmm. really well and will have, you know, quick decisions and processing and all of that. And so that makes it a little bit easier. But I mean, listen, I'm all about a floor spacing five. 
they don't just grow on trees right now. Like there's a reason no. that, you know, some of these guys are so special in the NBA. Like there's not a, just a plethora of these guys. And so that would be my one thing with the SAR is I love the idea. I love the defense, but now you're really having, you're like you're pigeonholing yourself into exactly what you have to put at these positions mm-hmm. without much room for air. Because the thing is, you want to build a roster that where it could work without a first basic big because those yes. guys are so hard to find. If yes. you're like the key to this rebuild working is getting a first basic five, that's probably a fundamentally flawed process given Correct. that that's just one of the hardest things. A guy that can shoot and play defense, like yes. there's a reason why we call those guys unicorns. Or you're going to give up the defensive aspect yeah. of that and then you, like Asar better be elite because he has to be your defensive anchor, Amari. Mm-hmm. And now the other two guys, other than Cade, they have to be really good defensively as well. So then do you give up how good a floor spacers? You know what I mean? Like there's just, exactly. you're making concessions everywhere. So it's just, to me, that's just not a reliable plan. And if you can't play a side without a floor spacing five, and to me, that just tells me that he's probably not a guy you could build around, which again, I think the handle is important for him, but he's got to be able to knock down open threes at the very least, because it was just crushed his first offense at times when you have a guy with his back turned to a side on the perimeter. Uh, like, you just can't do that. Uh, we have two more guys that are probably worth getting to in the last oh, few minutes here. Go oh, ahead and give the give give the update on Cade, and then we'll, oh, yeah, we'll yeah. do we'll do one and get out. Because like I said, we, we can talk about Monty and Troy and oh, yeah. all of that stuff. It, we have all off season to do it. Oh yeah. So Cade's questionable tomorrow. So you know, I think he was already ruled out for the last few games. So technically, he has been upgraded, but uh, we won't know that I'm sure until probably shortly before the game on uh, Tuesday, but. Do you want to talk Isaiah or do you want to talk Sass? No, let's do Sasser. Let's do Sass. Okay. I, I think Stewart is a is a bigger picture conversation as well yeah. in terms of, yeah, well, let's save Stewart. Because at some point I want to kind of just talk about him in general, kind of how he fits into the roster, if you mm. think you need another five, some stuff like that. So let's save Stewart for later. I want to talk about Sasser here with the on-ball versus off-ball. because And this may have been me. You, you may not have agreed with this, but I said the off-ball offensive role. I still see him being an more of an off the ball player. Am mm. I wrong here? Like, I, I feel like I'm crazy, but like everything he does was with the ball. And I love the way he's able to create separation for his own shot. Mm-hmm. I want him to create shots more for his teammates. And I want him to be able to be a floor spacer off the ball. It seems like he almost turns down catch and shoot. Um, it kind of reminds me of like watching Sadiq Bay back when we we're like, stop doing the shot fake one dribble stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being nitpicky here. It seems like Sass, they used to have a live dribble uh, to really get into a rhythm. Yeah. Which I think in like sort of a, you come off the bench, you're like an instant offense type guy. Like I think that could really work. Sure. Or if you play up next to a guy like K, yes. uh, you know, I think it could work. But I think the lineups around Sasser have not helped him at all. That's fair. Uh, there's been a lot of him being like the lone point guard on the floor. That's fair. Yep. Obviously, you can't play him and Malachi Fl- Flynn together. So a lot of it's just, just roster makeup. But. Uh, yeah, like Sasser's been like the lead point guard in a, a lot of lineups. And then you see games uh, like their loss against uh, the uh, Nets where they give up a 19 0 run to finish the game. It's just Ivy and Sass just alternating, taking, you know, jumpers, not really creating for anyone else. And to me, like the stretch since January 1st has affirmed in my mind that Sass needs a point guard next to him. And you almost run into a similar issue as a star where you have to have certain other roles fulfilled on the court for that player to be able to do what they do. If Sass isn't hitting shots, what is he giving you right now? And that's the issue. He's not quite there on defense. Like a lot of that's just because of his size. He's not much of a playmaker for others. And I think his first half was much, much better than his second half this season. Uh, you know, he's a, an older guard. So, you know, do you, is it realistic for him to come back and be more of a complete point guard next season? Or do you just accept that, you know, he's probably going to be more of an off the bench guy who could really heat up and get points in a hurry, but you've got to have a uh, perimeter defense around him and a big that can defend as well. Yeah, no, it'll, it'll be interesting. And listen, I want to be transparent. Like I was excited about the pick. Um, you know, I think maybe I didn't do a good job enough job kind of scouting who he was going to be as a player, like what his archetype and role was. Mm -hmm. Last thing here we had for the Pistons Pulse for this podcast consistency. I feel like we've done that. I mean, I think if nothing else, like if you want to say whatever you want about us, 
good, bad, indifferent. We don't know what we're talking about. We do. We don't work hard enough. We do work hard enough, whatever. We, we bring you an episode every single week for over two years now, 118 episodes. We work hard on the outlines. Wes holds it down for us there. Amari does look at the outlines. I was just joking on Twitter. <laughs> he does look at them. We come up with ideas. We try to get creative. We try to bring on guests. If nothing else, Amari, we are consistent. Any other things that, that you're looking at here as we go throughout the rest of 2024? I mean, I think consistency is just one of the most important things you can do or have in any endeavor. Uh, when people know you're going to deliver, uh, I think that does a lot to really build audience. And we've had a really low audience, which we're you know extremely grateful for. And we want to keep this going, obviously. Uh, I would still be awesome to do another live show at some point, but that's logistically obviously a lot tougher. Yeah, uh, It's funny, like, I, this is close to, like, the year anniversary of our last one because yeah. it was the same night as the uh, men's national title game. It was. It was the, the night of the national title game. And, yeah, it, we had a good turnout. So, yeah, it was, yeah. this would be the, the one year of it. That's uh, Yeah, I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah, so within the next year at some point, it would be nice to do a second live show. No, it would be. I just need to, yeah. again, I love Detroit. This has nothing to do with me not wanting to come. It, it literally doesn't even have anything to do with We know yeah, you love Detroit. I, I know. We know I'm, it's not personal. People are going to say, oh, it's because the team stinks. Like, it, it doesn't even have to do with that. Every year we've yeah. talked about this team and done the podcast on the team, the team hasn't been very good. It just wasn't in the cards for me to make it to Detroit this year. Well, we just need to schedule one at the start of the season whenever things are a little more exciting for everybody and, and all of that. And I think we've talked to a few people. We may have even have some special guests whenever we do that that would come and do it with us. So, um, But yeah, consistency, man. We just keep putting them out, doing what we do through the wins and the losses and a lot of losses and, and all of that. Um, I love doing it. I know I was excited all day for this and – I text you guys after last week when we recorded in the morning. Like I had this jolt of energy after we got done recording. I was walking to school and it's like, man, I got a pep in my step today. And yeah. so um, definitely some release of energy as we're doing this. So shout out Wes, Omari, everybody. Love working with you guys, Robin, all of that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. We'll be back Monday, Tuesday next week. Probably just go full-fledged off-season starting then and uh, take you guys through the off-season. Yeah, next time we talk to you all, uh, it'll likely be after exit interviews. So uh, we have to figure out exactly when we can plan that episode. But stay tuned for that. Thanks for sticking with us through uh, a difficult 23-24 season. And next week, we're going to dive into, uh, you know, some bigger term, longer term offseason stuff, which will be fun. And with that, I will close this out. Big thanks to our audio producer, Robert Chan, our editor-in-chief, Deco Avery Nichols, our executive producer, Anjanette Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirkland Crawford. And a big thanks to Wes, as always. And we'll talk to you all next week.